Our next speaker is Dr. Ludovic Pelligond. Ludovic graduated from uh, Maison Al 4 in 2001 and completed a small animal internal medicine internship and then completed uh, a residency in anesthesia at the Royal Veterinary College in London where he became uh, a diplomate of the European College of Veterinary Anesthe Anesthesia and Analgesia. Ludovic has just finished a, a, a PhD on, at the Royal Veterinary College on the roles of cyclooxygenase isoenzymes in the regulation of inflammation and renal function in the cat. He's now a, a clinical research fellow at the Royal Veterinary College and is developing programs in pharmacology, anesthesia and in pain management. Ludovic is going to present to us this morning the efficacy of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in analgesia versus their action as an anti-inflammatory agent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm very pleased to be invited here to, to speak to all of you and, uh, and maybe to contribute in the debate. Um, so as, uh, as um, the introduction said, I, I had a chance to, to work in London in the RVC where <coughs> I actually worked on the supervision of Peter Lees, and uh, I've uh, discovered the models he developed uh, along the last 20 or 30 years, and Peter is still active in that field. Um, today I'm going to speak about the efficacy of NSAID analgesia versus their anti-inflammatory effects comparing two experimental approaches. Uh, so we've uh, discussed about that before, but pain and inflammation, because they are uh, unpleasant experiences, um, uh, experienced by the horses are actually uh, have deleterious effect on the, on the racing horse. Um, and that's why, uh, for welfare reasons, um, uh, medications such as um, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are actually available and used uh, to, to relieve the symptoms in horses, but there is a concern that these uh, pain-relieving substances might have some uh, masking effects on some of the symptoms, possibly conferring an unfair advantage in comparison to a horse which doesn't uh, benefit from this treatment. But we have to remember that pain is also something protective, that's a signal sent from your body that tells you, oh, you should stop and rest until uh, you heal properly. Uh, so that's something we should remember, and um, the study from uh, Derek Colu has evidenced some possible association between uh, the level of menstrual in the blood of uh, horses that had injuries during uh, racing or uh, competition events. Uh, and finally, the NSAIDs have common properties, they act on the same mechanism, but due to um, different pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic properties, actually they can behave quite differently in, uh, in a, uh, an experimental or in a, a clinical animal. So, in my presentation, I tried to well, first briefly explain the relationship between inflammation and pain in these horses, um, and then highlight the uh, methodological differences we have between different models of inflammation or between different clinical studies of pain and inflammation, and then hopefully describe the pharmacological concept which are really relevant and we should all agree on when we are discussing about efficacy of NSAIDs. Um, so that's the, the, the plan of my slide. So I'll start up with the relationship between pain and inflammation. This is a slide from uh, Derek Willoughby who did a, a lot of inflammation work in, in, uh, in human, and that just to show you the that the pain is actually uh, one of the four signs of the inflammation uh, quatuor here. Uh, redness, swelling, heat, and pain have been described very early by Celsius, and it's only later that the loss of function has been introduced by other pathologists. Um, and we've seen that slide before as well. Due to uh, tissue damage, uh, arachidonic acid can be released in tissue, and arachidonic acid is actually the substrate uh, for cyclooxygenase to uh, secrete or to, to produce a variety of uh, prostanoids which have different functions. And here that's the cyclooxygenase 1 enzyme which is constantly expressed and have some housekeeping roles. And you can see that it's actually important to uh, actually produce PGI2 and process cycling to protect the stomach in case of non steroidal administration, uh, to protect the stomach. Uh, they have uh, a, a regulatory effect in the kidney to maintain renal perfusion and renal blood flow. And also there are some uh, roles in coagulation and, and uh, for example, cyclooxygenase on the platelet is involved in the thromboxane A2 generation in a, in, that, that ensures clotting and platelet aggregation. 
So that's an important function. Um, and here, the COX2 uh, isoenzyme is the one which is expressed in various conditions uh, and by various mediators, but that's the one which is going to be expressed when you've got uh, inflammation and pain. And uh, that isoenzyme produces PGE2 at sites of inflammation, and that's the one which is uh, associated with uh, pain in these models. So classic NSAIDs, uh, in, in equine medicine, most of the NSAIDs are actually either non-selective or very mildly selective for uh, the cyclooxygenase 2 uh, up to uh, recently, so they would block all these pathways here. Uh, and recently some uh, work has been done with uh, new COX-2 selective inhibitors and in the, the, the theoretical benefits of this one is that they would just inhibit the inflammatory component and uh, leave untouched the physiologi physiological regulation. Um, that result from in vivo, but we need more we need these drugs to be tested in inflammatory models to, to um, verify that it works in, vitro, in vivo. Um, so we, we've seen that uh, prostaglandins are actually involved in the inflamed tissue in order to uh, sensitize the nociceptors uh, to the action of uh, painful stimulus such as histamine, bradykinin, protons, for example. But they also have a central role, uh, which uh, actually it happens in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. That's where the, the nerve involved in pain feeling are being um, uh, integrated in spinal cord. And here there might be, uh, there could be a, a degree of COX-2 induction here. And if that happens, um, there is a, a, a central sensitization phenomenon that can, that can occur. And we, that's where we've got gene expression and neuroplasticity happens. And that's where it becomes more difficult to, to manage an animal which has been uh, exposed to pain for, for a long time. So they act both on these two sites, either in the periphery, uh, where we've got the pain signal transduction, but also at the spinal cord level, uh, at the, when, when the, the pain signal, the pain, the nociceptive in, impulse is uh, integrated. And they might also have some effect as antipyretics uh, central in the thalamus. Mm -hmm. Right, so now I'm just going to the second approach, uh, second part of the talk, where I'm going to discuss the traditional approach uh, versus the PKPD approach that have been uh, championed by, by Peter Lees and Pierre-Louis Toutain and some other researchers. Um, so if you want to find the right dose for a horse, you, you're going to design that kind of trial where uh, you uh, are going to expose the horses to different doses in, by increasing... Um, increasing um, exposing them to increasing doses, and then you're going to, to find a dose which is significant, gives significant, significantly higher uh, pain relief for, or anti-inflammatory effect from the subsequent doses. And here in this case, the dose, second dose is significantly better than the first dose, and the third dose, which is higher, is not significantly better than second dose. Therefore, you're going to choose the second dose as, uh, as the the one you would like to, you would like to use. The, the downfall of this approach is that between these two doses, uh, there is no extrapolation you can do because you're just looking at doses and you don't have access to plasma concentration. And that's how you would conduct as well clinical trials comparing uh, different drugs, comparing their efficacy or comparing their, that the new drug on the market is actually non inferior to uh, the one which has been used for several years. But, the problem is, is, is a dose really the best predictor of the effects? Um, and the answer is actually no. If you look only at the dose, which would relieve 50% of the animals or 50% of the symptoms, um, it's actually a hybrid parameter, which depends on pharmacokinetics um, considerations, such as plasma clearance and bioavailability, bioavailability and then the EC50, which is the, the concentration that would uh, be associated with 50% of relief. And it's, it's, it's really important to look at these bioavailability factors because depending on the route of administration, depending on um, whether you administer the drug on a staff or animal which has received uh, a meal, depending on the route of administration, that would also change. Uh, and the clearance might be affected by several considerations such as age or exercise level. And most of the pharmacokinetic study are actually done in horses which are at rest. So that, that's, that, can be, that can influence um, this concept here. So that's why we tend to now look at the plasma concentration in order to try to collate that with the effects. 
So that's uh, this one is an important slide that we, we need to distinguish between uh, the effect of the NSAIDs we're using. So the effect is the, the direct effect on the mechanism of action. There are COX inhibitors, therefore we're going to measure an inhibition of PG2 production in the site of inflammation. And this is a biomarker and this is correlated with the clinical outcome, but this is something quite different. And there are models that describe that. And there are models that look at this response. And the response is actually more clinically relevant. Uh, it's, it would be either suppression of lameness, it would be uh, a modification of stride length. And this is more directly applicable to um, somebody who would use um, the non all for that. But we need to have a, uh, to consider the EC50s of the two responses or effects. <laughs> so, in a nutshell, trying to explain PKPD in 20 minutes is quite difficult, but I think this graph might help. Um, these effects have a time course of, uh, so that might be like lameness, for example. You would describe a time course of the effects, and that's what we, do, what we document when you do a, a clinical study or when we, we treat a horse. Um, by taking blood sample, you're going to describe the time course of the plasma concentration. Uh, that's here for, for example, a non-vascular route. And integrating these two graphs, you're actually going to use this three-dimensional vector that comes towards you and to project yourself on the third graph here. That's the pharmacodynamic component that we want to, we want to know from the two previous ones. And classically, that has a, a sigmoid. Uh, um, the, the, the shape of this curve is usually sigmoid and described by this <coughs> equation here, where there are three important uh, uh, things to consider here, Emax, which is the maximal effect you can achieve with uh, the non uh, at the highest concentration, so that's this uh, kind of flat portion of the curve here. Uh, the EC50, which is the concentration that inhibits 50% of all that, that would explain, account for 50% of the response, which is here, and N, which is the slope of this uh, concentration effect relationship, and it's quite important to consider the three. Uh, so when we speak about efficacy, we're only speaking about the, ma the, the level of maximal relief. So to say that the drug is more efficacious, it means that you're going to have a higher level of relief. But when you speak about potency, that is related only to the um, concentration required to block 50% of the response. And here, you can say that the drug in red is more potent than uh, the drug uh, highlighted in blue because you use less of this drug to achieve the same 50% uh, effect. And then the slope is actually important. So here you've got a very, in blue, a very steep slope, which is usually what you would see when you are monitoring clinical responses, whereas here that's more a shallow slope um, with a more gradual response. And that's what you might see if you are looking at the biomarkers in a joint or in a tissue cage, for example. And combining potency and sensitivity, you've got the selectivity, which is something important in order to evaluate the risk-benefit ratio or the, or the side effects potential side effect of these drugs. So here I'm presenting the, the model uh, developed by Peter Lees and Andrew Higgins in, in the RVC in London. Uh, they started initially by um, placing some um, carrageenan soaked sponges into, uh, into incisions and then um, withdrawing them after some time in order to look at the concentration of prostaglandin E2 uh, soaked in these sponges. And they did that for placebo-treated horses and for horses that received various uh, oh, um, administration of various non steroidals And then looking at the inhibition of PGE2 in that uh, uh, circumstances. And then the subsequent model was a, a tissue cage model, uh, which was uh, actually, you, as the picture shows, you, you introduce under uh, sedation or general anesthesia uh, a, a tissue cage uh, under the skin, you can see here. And You've got several tissue cages per horses, and that has the benefit of enabling you to sample directly from the site of inflammation after injecting a carrageenan, which is a, a mild, uh, mild irritant that would trigger an inflammatory reaction. Um, so you would repeat that in a crossover fashion in order to uh, look at the efficacy of such, of, such, such non steroidal So you can measure the white blood cell count, the protein count, and the concentration, of the time course of uh, PG2, which is correlated to the COX-2 activity, and you are going to be able to measure the concentration of phenylbutazone or phenixin in the inflammatory site where it's active. 
Uh, and in the serum, we look at the inhibition of serum thromboxane from the platelet, and that gives us an indication of uh, the inhibition of COX-1. Um, here, that's a slide that shows that uh, with uh, that uh, ketoprofen concentration in the host, actually the, the concentration de decreases very quickly. Uh, so that at well, nine, nine hours, you can barely measure it anymore. Whereas in a tissue cage, actually, the don't struggle seems to be uh, stocked and, and persisting for much longer than uh, in the plasma. And actually, if you look at the time course of inhibition of PGE2, this is the placebo in blue here, and this is the different ketoprofen in entumers. It seems that the, the maximal suppression of PGE2 uh, occurs within nine to 10 hours, where actually there is barely any, any drug in the plasma. The drug is actually uh, detectable in, in the site of inflammation. So there seems to be a kind of mismatch between plasma concentration and the effect at the site of inflammation. And that's a very important concept that we have to agree on as well. It's this concept of negative hysteresis. If you give the drug by a, a non-intravenous route, the drug would be absorbed, and then you would have an increase of its concentration in blood. Uh, and um, at the same time, an increase of the effect. But once the drug starts to decrease its concentration in blood, you might reach the peak effect as illustrated in previous slides. Uh, and then after you come back to, uh, to um, uh, a low concentration and low analgesic effects. But that raised the question of if we detect uh, this concentration in the blood, uh, it could correspond to the horse being in a situation, one, where you've got your uprise to get maximal effect, or it could be in this situation where, here where you actually are past the peak, um, the peak uh, clinical effect. Therefore, it's with only one blood sample, it's sometimes difficult to know where you are. This, this, um, this hysteresis can be explained by pharmacokinetic origin, whether you have to actively transport the drug in the site of inflammation or in the joint, and um, whether you have to generate an active metabolite, which is more active than the uh, parent compound. So that could be accounted by that, or that could be accounted by the fact that actually it takes time for a non steroidal to inhibit the inflammatory response. Uh, and for all, some other drugs, for example, you, where you've got um, cascade and signal transduction, that might uh, be the, the cause for uh, hysteresis of pharmacodynamic origin. And you can tell me, well, that's, that's very good. That's, a clinical, that's a, an experimental model. The drug gets trapped in tissue cages. This is due to the geometry of the tissue cage. But no, actually, you find that hysteresis in um, experimental model of carpitis. And you'll find that as, as well in clinically uh, lame horses, which have been presented for lameness. And you would see that in an inflamed joint, uh, a drug such as um, this, this case, it's, it's ketoprofen, would accumulate and uh, have a higher concentration than in plasma for a protracted amount of time. Um, so that hysteresis actually happens in, in clinical horses as well. So we should also take that into account. The other uh, model of pain that has been developed by uh, various investigators, but Pierre-Louis Pierre uh, was the, the, um, the one that used this model to uh, perform PKPD modeling, is, a, is an arthritis model. Uh, so uh, taking a sun horse and injecting um, a front adjuvant uh, into a joint that would give a lameness for persisting for several weeks. And looking at uh, validated endpoints, such as stride length, rest angle flexion, and skin temperature, there were the, in, in, in this study the, 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 the end point, clinical endpoints which has the, the best um, metrological uh, performance, the most reproducible. And using uh, plasma concentration in, in association with the time course of the effect on these three parameters to look at, um, to try to define the PD um, for this, uh, these three uh, endpoints. Um, so here, if we look only at flunixin um, on the effect of stride length, on stride lengths, for example, you'll see that uh, there is a maximal effect that is attained here, around eight hours, uh, whereas actually the flunixin is quite low in concentration already. So that illustrates this history, this phenomenon. Now, if you look at uh, phenylbutazone, uh, given at clinical doses, um, there is there is a, a, a maximal effect reached by phenylbutazone here, which is lower than phenixin. So you can say that phenixin is more efficacious. Uh, but to say that phenixin is more potent than phenylbutazone, you need to look at the EC50s, which are 
symbolized here, uh, because EC50 of phenylbutazone, if of phenixin is lower, then also you can say that phenixin is more potent, but not because of the difference in maximal effect. Uh, so the, the, the beauty of this approach is that once you've got the pharmacodynamic data, the pharmacokinetic data, you can just play if you have to uh, use a, a different formulation for the horse, for example, or if you, you can simulate in a computer what would happen if you give a higher dose or repeated doses, for example. And here, in this situation, increasing the dose to 8 mg per kilo um, would actually increase the duration of the lameness relief for longer, and that is actually what has been verified in, in clinical studies. And that would ha what would happen if you give a, a half dose, you would still probably have a, a maximal effect relief, but for much, a much shorter period of time. So the two approaches, the tissue cage model and the carpitis model, are actually complementary. They address different uh, points. Uh, the first one looks at the effects. The second one looks at the responses. And we need to consider both when we are actually going to calculate the pharmacodynamic endpoints, which are directly related to, uh, well, whether this concentration in blood would be associated with that effect. Um, and obviously, if you, if you look at different clinical endpoints, you might have slightly different EC50s, of, um, so the, the concentration that would be required to block lameness would be different than the one that would give you a straight leg, for example. So that's one of the differences. And the other difference is the slope as I said before, of the uh, effect concentration relationship, uh, because if you look only at PG2, you might be able to detect minute effect, because the slope is very shallow, at very low concentrations. Whereas if you look at a lameness, for example, which is the, the clinical endpoint, the, you might not be able to detect, you might not be sensitive enough to detect a, a, a minute effect because it's a, it's a one or zero uh, relationship like that. Um, so that's, uh, that's another important difference. We should maybe consider the, the two EC50s originating for both models. Um, we acknowledge that, okay, the models are, um, they are model dependent. That might not be exactly what happens in the clinical animal. Um, and it's, uh, it's in a very little number of animals, so we don't really know what's happening in a large population. But now we try to take this PKPD approach into the field to, in order to, to have a bigger sampling size and uh, a, bigger, um, a bigger field to generalize the, the finding of the study. And um, the, the findings which um, originated from a uh, PLU210 study actually um, correlate or are in agreement with clinical studies that has been published later. Um, so that comforts us in the fact that actually this approach is valid. It's actually, this approach is actually uh, what was useful in uh, the dose confirmation or the dose determination of uh, several non throttle in the horses, uh, especially minoxicam, for example, that's another model and another uh, paper of Professor Tutan I haven't spoken about, but that uh, was actually very useful uh, to determine the dose that would be efficient in, a, in, a, in an animal. And it's been widely used in other species in the non throttle field uh, in order to amend dose age regimen or propose a, a first. Uh, a first dose for a clinical study, and also in human, it's becoming, it's becoming increasingly accepted by regulatory authorities. So uh, that would be something in the future that would become quite important. And this is a very versatile approach. If you, uh, if you have a good PK data set, a good PD data set, there is virtually no bound to the stim simulation and what you can do to, to try to foresee result of clinical study, maybe improve your clinical design the design for your study. And this is also very trans transposable to other analgesics, such as opioids, for example, that might be used in, uh, in um, equine medications, or in other fields, antimicrobials, for example. <coughs> OK, I'd like to thank the organizers and, uh, and uh, my collaborators as well. And thank you for letting me for the speak here. Thank you very much. <laughs>